Hi everyone. Um, are you able to see my screen? Uh, yes, we can see your screen. See, see my uh, slides? Yes, we can. Great. Oh, fantastic. All right. Sorry about that uh, muck up, but we, uh, we got there in the end. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm uh, speaking to you from Her Majesty's Prison, Melbourne, uh, where we're uh, uh, not allowed to leave home, let alone our uh, city nor our state, and uh, none of you people want us anyway, so uh, that sort of uh, suits you guys, I guess. But uh, anyway, it is nice to be able to talk to uh, talk to some people. I haven't spoken to anyone for eight weeks, but so this is pretty exciting for me uh, today. Um, I've been asked to speak on uh, on a nice controversial topic, uh, and that is running on fat. Um, uh, a couple of disclosures first, I'm the founder of Sugar by Half, a not-for-profit campaign, and as uh, Tracy uh, kindly just said, I'll have to pay her even more now, uh, given my book a plug, a fat lot of good. So uh, they're my disclosures. Um, I want to talk about the, uh, the history of, of fueling for, uh, for athletic performance, uh, to examine the evidence for the use of both carbs and fats as fuel, and then to have a little look into the future and, uh, and where it's just all going to go. So let's go back a little bit and... Uh, Let's face it, we've all been part of the carb generation. Uh, it's been, as far as sports nutrition goes, it's been carbs, 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 and that's basically been it. And to be honest, I got pretty uh, bored with sports nutrition uh, over the years because that's really what it was all about. You know, pasta parties the night before the marathon, um, Gatorade, Powerade, uh, during all sporting activity. It was just simply a matter of keeping your glycogen stores uh, full and using carbohydrate as a fuel. Pretty simple, really, and everyone was doing it. But does the dependence on carbohydrate really make sense? As you've heard from, uh, from Richard, I mean, there's a limited amount of energy available in stored carbohydrate, probably about 1,800 calories. Whereas there is more than 40,000 calories available in stored fat. So wouldn't it be nice if we could access some of those stored calories instead of having to use up our 1,800 all the time? There's a problem with carbohydrates, obviously, is that you have to keep replenishing your stores. You use them up, you uh, run out of, of glycogen and you have to replenish your, your carbohydrate stores. Or maybe if we're running off fat, we don't have to do that. So what's the best fuel? Is it fat or is it carbs? Well, as I said, for years now, everyone's been uh, carb oriented. But in fact, way back uh, you know, a few decades ago, some of the greatest athletes in the world were actually experimenting with low carb diets. Interestingly enough, they didn't tell anyone about it at the time because they, uh, I think partly they were probably a bit embarrassed about it, but secondly, they didn't want to give their opponents an advantage by letting them know that they'd discovered the low carb way to do endurance athletes, to do endurance events. Quite interesting historically. But look, there's been a lot of uh, anecdotal evidence, if you like, a lot of people out there who are claiming that fat is a better fuel for endurance events in particular. The person who's always quoted is uh, Zach Bitter, who's an American who holds the 100 mile record now why you'd want to run 100 miles is another issue but uh, let's not go there but um you know that is obviously an ultra endurance event and he doesn't uh, eat any carbs at all and he's a group, big proponent of using fat as a fuel he doesn't have to refuel nearly as much uh, during his 100 mile run in fact he hardly refuels at all and uh, he's able to break uh, break records lots of other anecdotal stories that the proponents of the low carb for fuel uh, campaign if you like push out all the time. There's, uh, they often bring out Chris Froome, who uh, lost a lot of weight before he became an elite uh, cyclist. He was sort of an average cyclist, then, uh, then lost a lot of body fat through uh, reducing his carbs and uh, uh, credited that with, uh, with his amazing performances in winning a number of Tour de France. What that's been extrapolated to, and he actually showed this photo of his breakfast uh, on, a, on a morning of the Tour. But the interesting thing is that that morning was a rest day and that was his rest day breakfast. And everyone jumped to the conclusion that he was doing the Tour de France on low carb. Um, but the reality was on his big, uh, big days, on the cycling days, he was still loading up on massive amounts of carbs. So, you know, you've got to be a little bit careful about, uh, you know, how you interpret stories and, uh, and media and everyone, you know, has a, a particular, something they want to push will grab onto any piece of, uh, of information. And there's lots of other, you know, uh, American basketballers who've, uh, who've dropped weight on low carb. 
We've got American footballers even, who uh, one always thought uh, the fatter they were, the better. But uh, some of them have dropped uh, low carb. Um, there's some other great athletes, uh, such as uh, the great uh, Courtney Kardashian and uh, equally a wonderful athlete, uh, Hayley Berry, who've also uh, done very well on, on a low carb, uh, low carb diet. So how many carbs are people talking about? Well, the endurance athlete has something well over 500 grams of carbs a day when they're in heavy training, which is a massive amount. That's a challenge in itself to get that amount of carbs in. The average punter, the average Australian is probably somewhere between two to 300 grams a day. We define low carb. Well, it's, it's debated what the definition of low carb is, but it's probably under 120 maybe grams a day. And then if you want to go into ketosis, you've got to get significantly lower than that, down to under 50, under 30 and, and uh, maybe under 50, depending on, on the individual. So that's really what we're talking about when we talk about low carb eating. So where's the science? You know, I've talked, I've given some anecdotes that tend to suggest that maybe there are people, a lot of endurance athletes in particular out there using a low carb, healthy fat uh, diet for performance. But what about, uh, what about the science? Well, the science goes, way back to, uh, to our good friend, Steve Finney, back in 1983, who was the first one really su to suggest that chronic ketosis may be an, a competitive advantage in, uh, in submaximal exercise. Now, this study has been heavily criticized uh, over time, um, but uh, Steve and, uh, and his friend, Jeff Bollock, have put out this wonderful book that I'm sure many of you have read, uh, The Art and Science of Low Carbohydrate uh, Performance. And, they're still very strong advocates of a low carb diet for uh, exercise and endurance performance. Some time later, Jeff Follett put out this uh, metabolic characteristics of keto adapted ultra endurance runners. So they were really pushing hard that this was a, an advantage for uh, endurance athletes. However, there have been a number of studies that tended to uh, negate that theory. This is one that showed a, a fat rich diet as detrimental to uh, improvement in performance back in 1996. Uh, in 2003, small decrements of, uh, of peak power performance and endurance performance in a, in a six-week uh, high-fat diet. Even uh, in, uh, one from Tim Noakes' uh, lab suggested that the diet compromised high-intensity sprint performance. So it wasn't all uh, one-way traffic as far as the, uh, the research goes. Here's uh, another study that showed there was no significant difference in 5K, five kilometer time trial performance, uh, although there was a trend. So not really strong evidence one way or the other. This is a, uh, a review article from, uh, from John Hawley, uh, a Melbourne based uh, researcher, who came to the conclusion that fat rich diets do not improve training capacity or performance, but directly impair rates of muscle glycogenolysis and, and energy flux. So again, very near this, the, the sort of the traditional or the, the standard uh, dietitian, food science uh, people were still maintaining that a low carb diet was not an appropriate way to go. Uh, again, another study uh, from 2014 showing a ketogenic diet decreasing the ability to perform high intensity work. And we've got to draw a, a line between what's high intensity and what's low to moderate intensity. We'll come back to that, uh, that shortly. So here's a, uh, a conclusion from another study that showed that uh, a low carbohydrate diet reduces both performance and total aerobic energy. So that seemed to be pretty much, uh, much it. Um, high carbohydrate diet helping greater distance. Again, more evidence from a Greek study in, uh, in soccer players against the use of a low carb diet. Karen Zinn, our colleague in, in New Zealand, uh, did a nice, uh, a nice pilot case study that showed there were benefits for body composition and well-being, but not performance in a pilot uh, case study of endurance athletes. So coming back to, uh, to John Hawley, in particular, Louise Burke, who is really, for those of you who don't know Louise, uh, she was based in Canberra for many years as the head dietitian of the Australian Institute of Sport and uh, the Australian Olympic team. And they came to the conclusion that, uh, um, Patterns of fuel utilization that favor fat oxidation. So in other words, a, a low carb diet does not provide clear benefits at all. And as I said, Louise is really regarded probably worldwide as, as the, uh, the preeminent sports nutritionist in the world. And she's always been absolutely adamant 
that uh, that low carb was not appropriate for uh, for elite athletes. In fact, in in two thousand and six, she came out and uh, and saying that uh, those at the coalface of sports nutrition can delete fat loading and high fat diets from their list of genuine ergogenic aids for conventional endurance and ultra endurance sports. And that really was the end of it as far as the nutrition community and the, and the dietitian community were concerned. But then things started to change a little bit. And uh, there was some start, people started to talk about uh, variations in, uh, in training in carbohydrate load depending on the amount of training. So this one, uh, deliberately training in conditions of reduced carbohydrate availability can promote training induced adaptations of human skeletal muscle. Such data has led to the concept of training low but competing high. In other words, when you, when you have a load, uh, low load training day, you might have a low carbohydrate intake, but then when you have a high training day or a competition day, you will increase your carbohydrate intake. Training low, competing high. And we'll hear a bit more about that as we, uh, as we go along. So again, we started to hear about this periodized nutrition or personalized nutrition where you adapt the uh, carbohydrate intake depending on the expected load, the training load for, uh, for that day. So it was, while it wasn't uh, completely switching to low carb, it was people acknowledging that there was a, a place for low carb eating in, in it. And as I said, periodized nutrition refers to the planned purposeful and strategic use of specific nutritional interventions to enhance the adaptations targeted by individual exercise sessions or periodic training plans or obtain other effects that will enhance performance longer term. Let's skip a bit of uh, this now. So, in two, so that in 2015 led Louise Burke to reassess things. She re-examined high fat performance diets for sports performance. And she talked about the nail in the coffin for low fat, uh, for, um, for high fat diets. And the question she'd asked then is, did she call the nail in the coffin too soon? She claimed that the current guidelines for carbohydrate intake in the athlete's training diet appear to be poorly understood. Sports nutrition experts do not promote a high carbohydrate diet for all athletes. Well, that was news of most of it to most of us in the uh, in the sporting world because uh, I sure as hell uh, heard that being said for about thirty years. But uh, all of a sudden, Louise decided that they weren't promoting a high carbohydrate diet, and uh, it was all just a bit misunderstood. So here she is trying to sort of uh, backpedal a little bit because I think she realised that uh, even if low carb wasn't uh, completely the way to go, that there was probably a role for it somewhere in sports nutrition. Louise initially was very, very aggressively anti-low carb, anti-ketogenic. Uh, and uh, in fact, in one of her lectures, she said uh, that Bruckner and Noakes should be in jail. And um, I actually uh, thought about that and I heard about it and I thought, wow, if I was gonna be in jail with anyone, I'd love to be in jail with Tim Noakes. Imagine having, the, having access to Tim Noakes' brain full time for, uh, well, you know, maybe not too long, but uh, I thought that wouldn't be such a bad thing after all. But anyway, Louise and, uh, and I have, uh, have made up and, uh, and we're buddies again now. But what, uh, what she did suggest was that the evolving model is that athletes should follow an individualized approach where carbohydrate intake is periodized through the training cycle. She also said there's a need for ongoing research. And to be fair to Louise, she went and did uh, that research. Now, those of us in the sports medicine world know that research using elite athletes is very, very difficult. In fact, it's almost impossible to do. Uh, but Louise with her uh, connections and her, I guess her prestige and her reputation was able to get some of the world's best race walkers who come to the AIS every year over Christmas for some warm weather training and, uh, and a training camp. She was actually able to do a research study where she looked at uh, uh, the potential of a low carb diet in these elite race walkers. Um, so she looked at the them adapting to a ketogenic, low carb, high fat diet during three weeks of intensive training on, uh, and the effect of that on their metabolism and performance. So they looked at three different diets, one with uh, the classic high carbohydrate availability before, consumed before, during and after training. Secondly, that 
with identical macronutrient intake, so still carbohydrate dominant, but periodized within or between days to alternate, depending on the training load between high and uh, low carbohydrate availability. And the third group was a low carb healthy fat uh, group. So what did they find? Well, first of all, not surprisingly, they found that uh, the low carb, high fat massively increased their fat oxidation and uh, beyond the level that uh, the textbook says that you're actually able to. So we've had to rewrite the whole textbook uh, about fat oxidation. So massive levels of fat oxidation in these low carb, high fat uh, diet uh, athletes. They also found that uh, oxygen consumption uh, increased in, uh, so this is the, the white bars are at the start of the, uh, of the three weeks, the black bars are, are at the end. And there was increased oxygen consumption, um, which actually was probably a negative in, in that it showed that their economy, uh, their running economy was, uh, was reduced. And probably most importantly, race times, because that's what we're about. We're really about performance. And you can see in the first two groups, the high carbohydrate group and the periodized carbohydrate group, their uh, race time came down significantly, which is what, uh, what you want. Not surprising, a three week intense training uh, camp, you'd expect their performances to improve. This is over a 10K uh, race walk. But in the low carb, high fat group, the performance was actually slightly worse. So instead of uh, being markedly improved, uh, they, were, uh, they were somewhat worse. Now, so that again, seemed to support Louise's uh, theory that there was no room for a low carb, high fat diet in elite sport. This paper was uh, heavily criticized. It was very controversial, heavily criticized on a whole uh, range of issues. One being that the athletes selected their diets themselves. They weren't randomized. The other one that was only three weeks. And uh, while fat oxidation obviously can increase dramatically in three weeks, there's a feeling among the, uh, the low carb, high fat uh, advocates certainly that it takes a lot longer than three weeks to fully adapt to, uh, to a low carb, high fat uh, diet. So Louise took uh, a lot of those, uh, into, those into consideration. As I said, she concluded that uh, adaptation to a low carb, healthy fat diet impairs performance in elite endurance athletes. She got a lot of criticism, as I said, so she repeated, decided to repeat a very similar study, again, in a group of elite race uh, walkers a year or two later. And uh, this was the, the paper that came out of that. And again, there was uh, significant amounts, you can see in the bottom graph there, significant increase in fat oxidation, uh, and many of the same uh, results that showed in that uh, first one. Um, again, you can see uh, high ketone levels in the, in the bottom slide, which showed that they certainly were in ketosis and uh, uh, as a result of their, uh, of their ketogenic uh, diet. But what about performance again? Well, interesting results. And uh, these are the three, the three uh, groups in the top slide there. You can see that uh, the, um, this is the high carbohydrate group. So their, their 10 kilometer time trial times came down quite, uh, quite nicely. These are the individual results and these are the average. Uh, the periodized one, not so much, but still uh, improved. Whereas the low carb healthy fat uh, diet in nearly all the, uh, the cases, uh, uh, their time, their time was worse. So their, their performance decreased over that time. So that again seems to, uh, whoops, how do I get out of that? Um, but I want you to go down to the, to the bottom one. Uh, no, to the next one rather. And so these first two columns are their 10 kilometer time trial. Um, and you can see there that uh, there's a slight improvement in the carbohydrate group and a decrease in, in performance in the low carb healthy fat group. But that almost disappears when we then do a 20K time trial. So very interesting that uh, maybe a longer event, more endurance, uh, less intensity, the difference actually doesn't, uh, difference disappears. And in fact, a number of athletes in both groups did personal bests in this 20 kilometer time trial after their particular diets. And there was not much difference between, uh, between the two. So it may well be that uh, in the elite world anyway, the longer events, uh, the events over an hour, for instance, are suitable for a low carb uh, diet, whereas the ones under an hour are not. But the jury is still out on that. And there's still a lot of debate. 
Here's another uh, study looking at uh, a high fat diets in middle aged male, uh, male runners. And uh, not surprisingly, their body mass and skin folds uh, improved significantly. But there was no significant difference, although a trend towards improved performance in a 5K time trial. So maybe there's a difference between uh, middle aged male runners and the elite uh, athletes that Louise Burke was, uh, was talking about. Here we go, is another study that shows a five kilometer time trial performance at a pretty high intensity was independent of the runner's habitual diet. So no particular difference between a high carb and a low carb diet. So a lot of conflicting evidence out there. This is what uh, Finney and Volick say, while a ketogenic diet can put you into a state of nutritional ketosis in a matter of days, it can take weeks to months to become fully keto adapted. So how long does it take? Well, according to them, blood levels of, uh, of ketones come up to a, uh, a new steady state within a week, but one's subjective and objective ability to do vigorous exercise can take anywhere from several weeks to a few months to recover and then stabilize. In other words, the process of keto adaptation that allows for uh, increased exercise performance lags well behind the level of ketones in the blood. And so maybe the three weeks of Louise Burke's uh, study were just not enough to show an improvement. And this is what they uh, suggest, uh, Finney and, uh, and co, about uh, the reasons behind, uh, behind that lag of uh, mitochondrial biogenesis and recovery of uh, muscle glycogen conservation. So here's a study that looked at a 12 week program, 12 weeks of diet and exercise from Jeff Follick's lab, looking at keto adaptation and they had not surprisingly, again, reduced body mass quite markedly, reduced percentage body fat. And there was no change in a 100 kilometer time trial uh, race in, this, uh, in these groups between the low carb and the, high fat, and the low fat. Interestingly, this is the, uh, the high carb group here. And let's have a look at the low carb group here. And the two slowest cyclists, had a, a really dr quite dramatic improvement in performance. Whereas the others who are more uh, or better performers had, less, had much less difference. So again, maybe uh, it has a better effect on uh, lesser performers, if you like. It may have has had something to do with their, uh, their body fat levels, uh, who knows. In that uh, study, they did find that in, in the low carb group an, uh, an increase in sprint peak power and critical uh, power but no change in average power. Significant uh, change in the respiratory exchange ratio, which uh, um, was just talked about in the previous, which Richard talked about uh, earlier this morning. And uh, you can see there that the, uh, the, the, the respiratory exchange ratio increases quite significantly in the, uh, the low carb group. So they came to the conclusion that uh, low carb participants noted a drop in energy levels of performance during the first seven to 10 days a lag in performance for the first four to six weeks, but then by the end of the 12 weeks, they had improved their performance. Very interesting, uh, interesting findings. They did note that the low carb ketogenic diet may not be suitable for everyone, as five participants found the diet too difficult to adhere to, and two were unable to complete post-intervention testing. So what about, other than just pure performance, what about some other additional advantages of low carb? And these I think are really important from a uh, practical point of view. The first one is, as I mentioned earlier, the reduced need to refuel during activity. If you're doing an ultra endurance event, you're doing a, an Ironman or a half Ironman, if you're carbohydrate fueled, you have to constantly be replenishing your carbohydrate uh, supplies, either by liquid uh, or by gels or, uh, or bars. That can be extremely challenging. It's, uh, it can relate to or can cause a lot of gastrointestinal uh, problems. And uh, it's a massive advantage that you don't have to refuel during activity. And I've had people do half Ironman, Ironman, fast in a fasted state with drinking only water during, uh, during the race. Quite remarkable. That shouldn't be able to be done according to the traditional model. Weight loss. Well, we all know that uh, low carb uh, ketogenic type diets can be very effective for weight loss. And it, it always used to amaze me how so many so-called elite athletes are a little bit overweight, not massively overweight, obviously, but two or three kilograms overweight. And you put them on a low carb diet, they lose those extra two or three kilograms, it improves their power to weight ratio, and they're a lot better off. 
recovery in sport recovery is massive it's all about recovery you know ice baths and fueling and fluids and sleep and, and all these different uh, supplements that people take to improve recovery because you want to be able to recover as quickly as possible to either train or compete as soon as you can after your previous e effort it's become particularly important uh, for instance in this year's afl season where there are four and five day breaks between games and and the whole focus is on recovery and we know that muscle soreness uh, is much reduced if you're fueled by fat rather than fueled by carbohydrate. We know that sugar and carbohydrates are inflammatory and therefore you get a lot more muscle soreness after uh, activity than you do if you're, uh, if you're fueled on fat. And as I said, reduced inflammation, again, due to the reduced sugar intake. You know, these people who are, uh, these ultra endurance or endurance athletes who are purely carbohydrate uh, fueled are having massive amounts of carbohydrate. We've had a whole generation of endurance athletes who've had massive amounts of sugars and processed carbohydrates over 10, 20, 30 years. And are really concerned about the long-term effects of what that's gonna to do to their metabolic health. And we do see anecdotally a very high incidence of uh, cardiovascular problems in uh, recently retired ultra endurance and endurance athletes. Now that's always been uh, attributed to the strain on the heart, but I wonder whether it's not something to do with their, uh, their huge uh, intake of sugars to fuel, uh, to fuel their, uh, their endurance exercise. So interestingly from Karen Zinn, despite performance decrements and some negative experiences, athletes were keen to pursue this because of all those benefits that I've just talked about before, that maybe they're more important than the slight performance decrements. All right, so what do we know? Well, we know that uh, low carb diets will increase fat oxidation. We expect that and we know that happens. We know that some athletes, especially endurance, ultra endurance athletes perform better on low carb, healthy fat. We know that high intensity exercise appears to be compromised in most people with low carb diets. And the research evidence is not clear. It's very confusing. Studies vary, more high quality studies need to be done. What we don't know, how long does it take to fully adapt? Is three weeks enough? Probably not. Does it need 12 weeks? We don't know. With full adaptation, then does endurance performance improve? It probably does. What about all the other sports, the high intensity intermittent sports, the footballs, the basketballs and so on? We don't really know about that. We've, there have been a couple of studies on strength athletes and there doesn't seem to be any reduction in strength switching from carbohydrate fueling to fat fueling. What we don't know really is in these, uh, these other sports like football and basketball. What I suspect, well, I suspect there's considerable individual variation that we have respondents and non-responders. I have uh, elite athletes, AFL footballers, for instance, who are totally ketogenic and who are fine. I have others who've tried it and just felt they needed some extra carbs. I have uh, cyclists who, who feel fine when they're, they're riding at, uh, at sub intensity, but they, they tell me, that when they want to sprint or climb, they feel as though they don't have that extra gear without some uh, top up carbohydrates. So I think enormous individual variation, and it's a matter of trying and finding out what's the right amount of balance between fats and carbs for each individual athlete. Generally speaking, I would say that low carb healthy fat is better for ultra endurance, moderate intensity sort of exercise. Um, for high intensity, most athletes probably need some additional carbs, not a huge amount, but some additional carbs, maybe the night before or, uh, or uh, pre-race. And this concept of training low, competing high is quite an interesting one. In other words, on a low training day, low carbohydrate intake, high fat, when you uh, have a high training load or when you're competing, top up with, uh, with more carbs. And again, finding the right amount, and the right type is very individual. Further investigations are needed regarding performance after weight loss in, in weights uh, related sports, repeated high intensity performance, the development of central fatigue, uh, perceptual motor performance during uh, intermittent sports, what are the ideal dietary fatty acid compositions and what's the role of ketone uh, supplements. So as always, more questions uh, than answers, but it's a fascinating topic. But what do I tell my athletes? Well, I tell them their basic diet their everyday standard diet should be low carb, healthy, real food, avoiding sugars, processed foods, and seed oils. Standard advice. 
I say, give yourself plenty of time to adapt to that change of eating pattern if you're going to change to a low carb ketogenic diet. Don't do it the week before your marathon. You may find that you need to top up with some carbs before and or during higher intensity activity. And everyone is different. Find out what works for you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. That was brilliant. It was lovely. Thank you. Pleasure. Um, so there's been some questions asked while you were presenting. Do you mind if Richard comes up and asks you a couple of questions and you answer them? Is that all right? Sure, sure. Yeah. All right, welcoming back to the stage, Richard Morris. Richard, I had a very distressing time during your talk. I, I felt like I was back at university in second year <laughs> biochemistry and uh, brought back nightmares. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry about that. Well, it's recent no, history. It was very interesting, very interesting. I, I turned 55 in, in a week's time. And I've just got my undergraduate degree. So <laughs> Better degree late life. than never. Better late than never. So, um, so I've got a couple of questions. Um, I've got a question from Tony Sangster, and he says, uh, "Did the study showing a negative effect of LCHF diet on sports, um, assuming Louise Burke's studies, did they ensure adequate replacement of sodium and other minerals like potassium and magnesium?" Yeah, they, they say they did, but uh, but they didn't really measure it uh, measure it very well, and that's a very good point. I mean, I think we all know that uh, that extra sodium, in particular, and, and and potassium also, it's just so important in a uh, in a ketogenic diet, and it's often uh, it's often forgotten. Um, I think they were advised that they should increase sodium, but I don't think anyone actually measured their uh, their sodium. But uh, yeah, it's a very good point, and it may well be one of the reasons. Although. I actually think the reason is probably the, uh, the the length of time for adaptation. I just think you need significantly more than three weeks if you're going to do this uh, to do this properly. Yeah, so I think uh, Jeff Volek showed even after six months his athletes because athletes they know their PB to the you know to three decimal places. Yeah, they can see it. Whereas the rest of us idiots, we we think we're we're fat adapted after six weeks, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, I must admit, my own experience was that. Uh, I mean, I, I don't, I, know, I don't do a lot of exercise, but I, I felt my exercise capacity increased at about the six week mark. I remember being on a treadmill once and, and feeling like I could run forever, and, and I'd certainly never had that feeling before. And I reckon it was about the six week mark of my, uh, of my uh, change of diet. So everyone's different. That's the thing. I mean, we can't uh, generalize, and, and every athlete, every individual, uh, the same as every person out there has a right amount of carbs they should be eating. Uh, there's not a single amount of carbs that's right for everyone. It's the same with athletes. Yeah. So Ski Mum in Bend, Oregon says, and I think you've just answered this question, but she says, uh, did they take into consideration fat adaptation when testing these athletes? Yeah. Well, they, they showed that they were oxidizing a lot of fat. Um, yeah. And they concluded from that that they were fat adapted and that their ketone levels were, were, were high, which is absolutely true. I mean, they, they were uh, oxidizing a lot of fat, but uh, certainly people like Volek and, and Finney argue that that's only one part of the adaptation uh, equation, if you like, and there are other factors that take considerably longer. So, um, yeah, it's, it's hotly debated, but uh, I think, yeah, you, you can't really make a judgment unless... I like that 12-week study that, uh, that Fiona McSweeney did in Volek's yeah. lab, and... Uh, you know, interesting that she found an initial decrement and then it sort of leveled off and then things improved after about six weeks. So, you know, I think that uh, we need to do more work in that area. Yeah. So um, Tony Sangster also says, uh, is, is it not interesting that the ADA, the Australian Diet, uh, Diabetes Association and the Dietitians Association and, and uh, sorry, ADA, I guess, diet, yeah, and then DA, uh, uh, Diabetes DAA, Association. Yeah all have modified their spiel about diets for di diabetics and others from anti-low carb to indiv individualized. Is this a way to wiggle out of their anti-low carb uh, stand, which has led to so much suffering? Oh, well, I wouldn't possibly be able to, uh, to say something like that, but um, oh, that's, uh, but, uh, it doesn't seem like an unreasonable uh, assumption. Yeah, I think so. I, I, look, I think, uh, and, and Louise is the same. You know, I think people are realizing that that, uh, that hardcore, you know, it's all about carbs, uh, is uh, was way too uh, too extreme, and that people are trying to sort of backpedal a bit without losing too much face, and uh, without having to acknowledge that they've actually been wrong all these years. 
they're just acknowledging, well, maybe it's individual and, uh, you know, it, there might be a room for a, a low-carb uh, diet. So, small victories, but, uh, but we're getting there. So, I've got another question from uh, Carol who says, uh, I'm an athlete, I've always been slim, I've been strict keto since late March, and I'm still weakly adapted. Does that mean I'm insulin resistant? Sure, what she means by weakly adapted. Weakly adapted, she yes, did. yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, look, uh, I mean, you might well be insulin resistant. Um, you know, you would hope in six months that you'd, re you know, largely reversed your uh, your insulin resistance and uh, on on a ketogenic uh, diet. Um, but you know, there's lots of tweaks. You know, we talked about you know sodium and potassium before. You know, there are there are some people who maybe you know need a few more carbs. Uh, I think it's just a matter of experimenting. You know, it's, it's not, you know, you can't say, right, 30 grams, you know, that's it, right, 30 grams of carbs for everyone. No, you know, some people actually do better on 50 grams. Some people might do better on 70 grams. And I think for athletes, it's a matter of just finding out what's, uh, what's right for you. We can't be too, you know, we criticise the, uh, the, the carb people for being rigid and saying it's, you know, it's got to be all carbs and so on. And yet, you know, we, we sometimes are guilty of the same thing. So, you know, we're all different. Try the right, try, change things around a bit and uh, you'll find the right amount of carbs for you. Yeah, I think what is, it's an awesome thing to in this time of quarantine to have tried a, an experiment in the keto. Um, yeah, you know, well, so, there's not much else to do, so you might as well no, exactly. You might as well go keto for the six months. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, and, and she makes a comment that, uh, that it's not just weight reduction, but uh, there's also added advantages of unloading joints for greater longevity. Yep, um, and and inflammation too. You know, uh, I mean, we're doing some. We've just done an interesting study at the Trobe University, looking at uh, an anti-inflammatory diet in knee, knee osteoarthritis, and had significant reductions in pain and improvement wow. in function, and uh, and presumably due to that uh, inflammatory effect. So yes, inflammation, weight loss. There are so many advantages, leaving aside the performance issue, that uh, uh, you know make you make it very advantageous to uh, exercising and playing sport on a low carb ketogenic type diet. Yeah, another, another question is, uh, what about dental problems in high carb athletes? Yes, yeah, good point. You know, I think uh, dental and the whole, the whole range of, uh, of uh, you know, cardiovascular, vascular, dental, you know, it, it'll be, be very interesting to, to look at their rates of type two diabetes in these uh, elite uh, endurance athletes with their high, uh, and that will be a fascinating study if we can uh, ever get that done. I suspect they'll be quite high. Uh, I think if you've spent 10, 15 years, you know, having uh, socking back uh, Gatorade and Powerade and, and gels and, and uh, pasta and, and everything like that, you know, it, they must be insulin, a significant number must be insulin resistant and we all know what happens after that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, another one final question I've got from Alison who says, I've lost 16 kilograms uh, and still pretty hardcore diet-wise, but my ketone measures are never much more than 0.6. Does your level drop when there's less weight to lose? And I, I just make the comment briefly before handing over to Peter. My physiological range, I've been keto for six years, my physiological range is 0.2 to 0.8. Um, and uh, Tim Noakes' range is exactly the same. And so, you know, and we're both hardcore keto, so... Well, I, I hesitate to uh, to jump on that bandwagon uh, with you and Tim Noakes, Richard, but mine's the same. I mean, I, I've never, you know, no matter how hardcore keto, I've never got about over about 0. 0.6. And, yeah. you know, other people that I've been living with, you know, who've been on the same have got up to two, three. And, you know, so again, a lot of individual variation. I don't think it matters that much uh, yeah. what your level is. Um, I think, you know, as long as you're, uh, you're uh, you know, do, doing the right thing diet-wise, mobilising those, uh, those fats and... Uh, yeah, don't get obsessed about uh, about ketone levels and so on. They're probably not that accurate anyway when you're when you're measuring them, uh, you know, by urine anyway, particularly. Yeah. Well, it's it's it's. I mean, I, I consider more than zero to be information, and more than that to be not really a lot of information. So, uh, yeah. as long as as long as you're not zero, I think you you're, you're in the right part of the of the of the graph. So. Sounds good. Anyway. Thank you very much for that, Peter. Um, thank you for the questions and for the presentation. And I'm sorry about taking you back to mentally back to <laughs> yeah, look, I'll, I'll work through it with my therapist. And I'll, I'll be okay. I think so. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's just fine. Thank you very much. And thank you to, to Liz and Trace. You've done a fantastic job uh, putting this all together. It's been a real pleasure to be involved. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Peter.